Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. May Elise Cannon. I'm the Executive Director of Churches for Middle East Peace. Today is Saturday, March 9th. Today is day 155. Um, I spent the morning um, for a few hours at a local Islamic center here um, in the Washington, D.C. area, and I was grateful to be welcomed with such hospitality. You know, we at Churches for Middle East Peace are grateful for the opportunity to engage um, in multi-faith uh, partnerships. And so I just would invite you, you know, if you are connected to a church um, or a synagogue or a mosque and would like to be in conversation with us, we would welcome that. So you should feel free to reach out. Um, if you agree with us and are calling for a comprehensive ceasefire, um, we'd love to work alongside of you. And if you disagree and would like to be in conversation, um, so you can connect with us um, via our email at info at cmep.org, um, or you can find out more information at our website. Um, updates in terms of what's been happening in the last 24 hours. Um, it's been reported that Israel, and we knew this, um, that they were building a road, but um, CNN just reported that the road uh, splits Gaza in two across the Mediterranean coast. Um, imagery from March 6th shows that this east-west road um, has been built by the Gaza, um, has been built by the Israeli military, and it stretches from the Gaza-Israeli border across the entire um, 6.5 um, kilometers. So that's the width, 6.5 kilometers. That's about four miles wide. Um, it divides North Gaza from South Gaza. I had mentioned before that there's a checkpoint that you have to go through that's controlled by um, the Israeli military. Um, so it divides Gaza City from the south of the enclave. Um, uh, about two kilometers includes an existing road while the rest is new. Um, it's a part of a security plan to control the territory. It's been reported for months or possibly years to come, according to Israeli officials. The Israeli Minister for Diaspora Affairs communicated to the news that the new road will make it easier for the Israeli military to launch raids into the north um, of Gaza City and to the south um, and to the central areas of the Gaza Strip. The road which he said will be used for at least a year, has three lanes or will have three lanes, one for the heavy tanks and armored vehicles, another for lighter vehicles, and a third for faster movement. It will be possible to drive um, on what's being called the Netzarim Corridor from Ber Ari, which is an Israeli kibbutz near the Gaza border, to the Mediterranean Sea in just seven minutes. Now, the Netzarim Corridor is the road being built by the IDF um, you know, that's that 6.5 kilometer wide strip. So that's the name um, for that area. It's being called the Netzarim Corridor, uh, dividing the north from the south, giving this operational foothold. This is deeply disconcerting. Um, you know, this uh, could allow for some Israeli officials in the government would like to um, return settlements into Gaza. You know, there's quite a bit of division um, in the current Israeli government about what should happen in Gaza um, once the military campaign there is brought to an end. More people have died in Gaza due to a lack of food and water, according to the health ministry. At least two more people died today due to severe malnutrition and dehydration, um, according to Dr. al a spokesperson for the Palestinian Ministry of Health. A two-month-old infant died in Kamal Adwan Hospital in North Gaza, and a 20-year-old woman died um, due to starvation. Um, the total number of people who have died um, from uh, starvation and malnutrition is now 25. Uh, the Pentagon Press Secretary, Major General Patrick Ryder, said yesterday that the floating pier that was announced by President Biden during his State of the Union could take up to one month, possibly two. And 1,000 troops will be used to build it. Um, Doctors Without Borders said that this is a glaring distraction from the real problem in Gaza. Uh, the U.S. Executive Director of Doctors Without Borders said Israel's indiscriminate and disproportionate military campaign and the punishing punishing siege is the real problem. And so yesterday when I talked about um, lipstick on a pig, you know, you know, the constant conversation about the humanitarian crisis, I just kept saying, you know, it feels like the U.S. government is not addressing the real problem. That's what I'm talking about. And so Doctors Without Borders um, uh, agrees and is saying the real problem is Israel's indiscriminate and disproportionate military campaign and the punishing siege, which, as I've mentioned, you know, has brought um, an average of 100 deaths a day, the vast majority of which are women and children. The U.N. reported that four out five households in Gaza do not have safe water. One of the uh, gentlemen who was speaking with me today at the mosque uh, was a physician from Syria, um, an American Syrian, um, who just got back from Gaza. He was on a medical mission there. Um, and I saw pictures and I saw videos of the European hospital in Gaza. And I just, um, words can't express um, what's happening there.
The Swedish government announced today that it's resumed funding for the primary humanitarian agency of UNRWA, um, the UN Refugee uh, Workers Association, um, because they've been given assurances of stricter controls in response to the allegations that some of the staffers um, might have been involved in the October 7th Hamas attacks. Those were accusations brought forward uh, by Israel. You may recall UNRWA immediately um, fired those staffers and um, started an immediate investigation. The U.S. conducted more airdrops, dropping 41,400 uh, meals and 23,000 bottles of water. Uh, negotiations updates. CIA Director Burns um, has been in the Middle East this past week. He also made stops uh, in, in specifically Egypt and Qatar. The U.S. has tried to help mediators broker a ceasefire in Gaza between Israel and Hamas. U.S. officials have said that negotiations have reached a standstill uh, and that the deal is unlikely to start, um, you know, to begin by Ramadan, which I believe starts tomorrow. Uh, in Israel, there's a battle brewing over whether, whether or not the young men of the Haradim, that's the Hebrew word for the ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel, should have to participate in mandatory military service. In Israel, there's mandatory conscription for both men and women, uh, two years for women and three years for men. Currently, for all practical purposes, uh, uh, the ultra-Orthodox Jews are exempt. And so that um, is a battle right now that's being um, you know, discussed and debated in Israel. Yemen's Houthis claim that they're targeting U.S. war destroyers in the Weds Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden with drones. The group's military spokesperson said that they are marking uh, their latest attack on shipping as Israel's uh, continuing to wage war in Gaza. You know, we've been consistently telling uh, the U.S. administration that this idea of military deterrence is being ineffective. It's actually bolstering resistance groups. Um, and so this idea of microaggressions, you know, by pro-Iranian groups, those groups are only getting stronger um, and more and more popular um, the more the U.S. engages in this strategy of military deterrence. You know, that was something we witnessed firsthand when we were on the ground just a few weeks ago. Gaza's death toll, 82 people were killed in the past 24 hours. The death toll um, last reported was 30,960 um, in the last 24 hours. There were an additional 122 injuries recorded. Just remember, these are only the recorded numbers. The injury toll reported uh, as of today is 72,524. The Times of Israel had an article I wanted to make sure to call your attention to. Uh, this was on March 7th. This was about Abe Foxman. He was the former director of the Anti-Defamation League. And he said two things are keeping him up at night. The deteriorating relationship between Israel um, and its one and only uh, most important ally, the United States, and how Jewish people will react to this explosion of anti-Semitism that's happening around the world. Um, he's a Holocaust survivor. He survived as a child. He then went on to work in the Jewish world for over five decades. Foxman was asked if he's surprised by the torrent of anti-Semitism that's engulfed the globe after the horrors of October 7th. And his response is he said, after 50 years of dealing with the subject of anti-Semitism, the answer is no, I'm not surprised. Because those dealing with the subject professionally understood a long time ago that anti-Semitism is a disease without an anecdote and without a vaccine. We reported on it, we monitored it, we recorded it, and we knew that it was there and that it was deep and that it was serious. And he went on to say the organized Jewish community developed a containment strategy. If we can't eliminate anti-Semitism, at least we can contain it. Keep it in the sewers and cover it. This means using every available media coalition, the memory of the Shoah, the truth, and threats of litigation. This containment strategy, he contends, fell apart because of two major factors, the internet and an endorsement of the end of civility in American discourse. Foxman called the internet probably the most significant instrument that has given legitimacy to anti-Semitism. It has given it a superhighway and the level of anonymity um, more than we ever could have imagined. I, I thought that was really helpful to understand. I agree that anti-Semitism has been on the rise. And, and I also agree that we absolutely and ardently need to work against it. Personally, I believe um, it can't be contained. And I think that a more constructive strategy has to be similarly to what I believe about peace, transformation, right? I, I don't think it could be contained. It's, it's, I feel like a containment strategy is similar to the strategy of militarization. You know, the idea in Gaza was we'll contain militaristic resistance. And I think that a strat, I think October 7th proves that military detainment or deterrence doesn't work. 
So I won't go through the whole article. I encourage you to read it. I think it's very important to understand. I agree with the diagnosis that anti-Semitism is real, that it is a legitimate problem today. We have to address it. I agree with our Jewish friends um, that that is a legitimate concern. Um, and if we're truly concerned about peace, friends, and if you are truly pal pro-Palestinian, you really, I, I encourage you, we must listen. Not only do we have to listen, we have to be committed to speaking out and working against anti-Semitism. We also have to learn how to legitimately be able to differentiate between anti-Semitism and legitimate criticisms of the policies of the Israeli of the Israeli government. I wrote an article about this a few years ago in Religious News Services about differentiating between anti-Semitism and legitimate criticism of the state of Israel. Based on what I learned from many of my Israeli friends who are committed to human rights and equality for Palestinians, um, and so I just wanted to call that to your attention. And so what can we do in the midst of this onslaught in Gaza um, and the things I talked about today? Speak out, share on social media messages that you support that call for a comprehensive and lasting ceasefire that are based on love and not hate. Reach out to Jewish friends, Palestinian friends in your community. Let them know that you're with them, that you're standing alongside of them. You know, listen, um, support efforts towards safety, security, peace and equality and freedom for both peoples. Um, call your members of Congress. We Weekly, if not daily, and ask them if they're not yet supporting a lasting and comprehensive, comprehensive end to the violence between the Israeli military and Hamas to support a lasting and comprehensive ceasefire, you know, to call for a return of the hostages. Um, a comprehensive ceasefire means all warring parties put down their weapons. Hostages are returned home in exchange for Palestinian prisoners, immediate and adequate humanitarian um, assistance into Gaza. The catastrophe in Gaza must be brought to an end, and we must no longer allow the U.S. government um, to sit by and be complicit. So join us, uh, sign up for our newsletters, become a church or organizational partner, send us an email if you want to know more, send a no donation, or if you can't, encourage others to support us, join our prayer calls. We, like the persistent widow in the Gospel of Luke, um, will keep knocking on the door. We will demand justice and seek peace until justice and peace are achieved.